That's the retreat of this glacier. The main stem, the main flow of the glacier is coming from the right, and uh, it's going very rapidly up that stem. We're going to be up there in just a few more weeks, and we expect that it's probably retreated another half a mile, but if I, if I got there and discovered that it had collapsed and it was five miles further back, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. Now, it's really hard to grasp the scale of these places because as the glaciers, one of the things is that places like Alaska and Greenland are huge. They're not normal landscapes. And as the, but as the glaciers are, are retreating, they're also deflating, like air is being let out of a balloon, right? And so there are features on this landscape. There's a ridge right in the middle of the picture up above where that arrow comes in that uh, shows you that a little bit. There's a marker line called the trim line above our little red uh, illustration there. This is something no self-respecting photographer would ever do. You put some cheesy illustration on your shot, right? And uh, yet you have to do it sometimes to narrate these points. But in any case, the deflation of this glacier since 1984 has been uh, uh, higher than the Eiffel Tower, higher than the Empire State Building. A tremendous amount of ice has been let out, out of these valleys as it's retreated and deflated, gone back up valley. These changes in the alpine world are accelerating. It's not static. Particularly in the world of sea ice, the rate of natural change is outstripping predictions of just a few years ago, and the processes either are accelerating or the predictions were too low to begin with. But, but in any case, there are big, big changes happening as we speak. So here's another time-lapse shot of Columbia. And you see where it ended in these various spring days, June, May, then October. Now we turn on our time lapse. This camera was shooting every hour. Geologic process in action here. And everybody says, well, don't they advance in the wintertime? No, it was retreating through the winter because it's an unhealthy glacier. Finally catches up to itself, it advances. And you can look at these pictures over and over again because there's such a strange, bizarre fascination in seeing these things you don't normally get to see come alive. I mean, we've been talking about seeing as believing and seeing the unseen at this uh, TED Global. That's what you see with these cameras. The images make the uh, invisible visible. These huge crevasses open up, these great ice islands break off. And now watch this. This has been the springtime this year. Huge collapse. That happened in about a month, the loss of all that ice. So that's where we started three years ago, way out on the left. That's where we were a few months ago, last time we were into Columbia. To give you a feeling for scale of the retreat, we did another cheesy illustration. London, there were British double-decker buses. If you line up 295 of those nose to tail, that's about how far back that was. It's a long way. On up to Iceland. One of my favorite glaciers, the Solomajökull. In here, if you watch, you can see the terminus retreating, you can see this river being formed, you can see it deflating. Without the photographic process, you would never see this. This is invisible. You can stand up there your whole life and you would never see this, but the camera records it. So we wind time backwards now. We go back a couple of years in time. That's where it started. That's where it ended a few months ago. And on up to Greenland. The smaller the ice mass, the faster it responds to climate. Greenland took a little while to start reacting to the warming climate of the past uh, century, but it really started galloping along about 20 years ago. And there's been a tremendous increase in the temperature up there. Big place, that's all ice. All those colors are ice, and it goes up to about two miles thick. Just a gigantic dome that comes in from the coast, rises in the middle. Uh, the one glacier 
up in Greenland that puts more ice into the global ocean than all the other glaciers in the northern hemisphere combined is the Ilulissat Glacier. We have some cameras on the south edge of the Ilulissat watching the calving face as it goes through this dramatic retreat. Here's a two-year record of what that looks like. Helicopter in front of the calving face for scale. Quickly dwarfed. The calving face is four and a half miles across. And in this shot, as we pull back, you're only seeing about a mile and a half. So imagine how big this is and how much ice is charging out. The interior of Greenland is to the right. It's flowing out to the Atlantic Ocean on the left. Icebergs many, 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 many times the size of this building roaring out to sea. We just downloaded these pictures a couple weeks ago, as you can see, June 25th. Monster calving events happen. I'll show you one of those in a second. This glacier has doubled its flow speed in the past 15 years. It now goes at 125 feet a day, dumping all this ice into the ocean. It tends to go in these pulses about every three days, but on average, 125 feet a day, twice the rate it did 20 years ago. Okay. We had a team out watching this glacier, and we recorded the biggest calving event that's ever been put on film. We had nine cameras going. This is what a couple of the cameras saw. 400-foot-tall calving face breaking off, huge icebergs rolling over. Okay, how big was that? It's hard to get it. So it, an illustration, again, gives you a feeling for scale. A mile of retreat in 75 minutes, across a calving face in that particular event three miles wide. The block was three-fifths of a mile deep, and if you compare the expanse of the calving face to the Tower Bridge in London, about 20 bridges wide. Or if you take an American reference to the U.S. Capitol building, and you pack 3,000 Capitol buildings into that block, it would be equivalent to how large that block was. 75 minutes. Now, I've um, come to the conclusion after spending a lot of time in this climate change world that we don't have a problem of economics, technology, and public policy. We have a problem of perception. The policy and the economics and the technology are serious enough issues, but we actually can deal with them. I'm certain that we can. But what we have is a perception problem, because not enough people really get it yet. You're an elite audience. You get it. Fortunately, a lot of the political leaders in the major countries of the world are, elite, are an elite audience that, for the most part, gets it now. But we still need to bring a lot of people along with us. And that's where I think organizations like TED, like the Extreme Ice Survey, can have a terrific impact on human perception and bring us along. Because I believe we have an opportunity right now. We're, we are nearly on the edge of a crisis, but we still have an opportunity to face the greatest challenge of our generation, in fact, of our century. And this is a terrific, terrific call to arms to do the right thing for ourselves and for the future. And I hope that we have the wisdom to let the angels of our better nature rise to the occasion and do what needs to be done. Thank you.